Mighty Buildings, a construction technology company based in Oakland, California, came on the scene in 2020 when they showed off their unique 3D printed synthetic stone homes. They aim to create beautiful, sustainable, and affordable high quality homes using advanced materials, patented 3D printing technology, and robotics automation. Instead of using concrete, Mighty Buildings uses a proprietary mix called LSM or light stone material. It's a polymer binder and mineral filler that instantly hardens when exposed to UV light. It's very similar to Corian, a solid surface material made by DuPont. While Corian countertops are made by a reductive process, LSM synthetic stone is made by an additive process. Its strength is comparable to concrete, but it is a quarter of the weight and a much better insulator. The print is scanned to verify the final dimensions and curvature. It can also be milled to create a smooth finish. Mighty Buildings have completed and delivered six Mighty Mods and are currently manufacturing 30 more. The Mighty Studio, which measures 25 feet by 14 feet and has an exterior footprint of 350 square feet, costs around $185,000. The one-bedroom Mighty Duo B, which measures 28 feet by 25 feet and has an exterior footprint of 700 square feet, costs around $250,000. The two-bedroom version, which also measures 28 feet by 25 feet, costs around $265,000. Every unit has a full kitchen and bath, quartz countertops, oven, refrigerator, dishwasher, microwave, washer, and dryer. I recently visited their factory in Oakland and got a behind-the-scenes look of their units from the skeleton to the finished product. The factory tour gave me a whole new understanding of the company and the construction technique. It also reinforced my belief that the realm of 3D printed construction is filled with hyperbole and misinformation. If you haven't watched my last video on the topic, I'll link it up here. I still can't believe it, but yeah, 3D print it. No! This house behind me was built using a 3D printer. No! Imagine this, a giant 3D printer makes this building that we're inside of. No! There is no critical thinking, no analysis. Journalists and YouTubers are regurgitating lies to their million plus subscribers, which cheapens the technology in the long run. I had a very insightful conversation with Sam Rubin, Chief Sustainability Officer and Co-Founder of Mighty Buildings, who was very transparent about the company. Their core values and long-term strategy are very inspirational, but those aspects are being drowned out by the noise. So in this video, we're going to break that cycle of misinformation and uncover the truths. But before we do, don't forget to hit that subscribe button to help me get to 100,000 subscribers. First off, this structure that you've seen in YouTube videos is not the final unit. 3D printing the entire shell out of synthetic stone was an unsuccessful experiment. It's set aside in the factory and it's a goal that the company hopes to get to eventually. It's not precise, it has a rough finish with obvious seams and massive cracks in the walls. For now, the structure is made of a traditional heavy gauge steel frame welded and bolted together with light gauge steel used for the interior walls. The 3D printed curve is a tiny, non-structural part of the unit hidden behind drywall. All the components are manually put together. Subfloor sheathing, fiberglass insulation on the ceiling, Tyvek house wrap, zip tape around the windows, radiant barrier polyiso on the sides, and all the electrical, plumbing, and HVAC parts. Other than that one curved wall, the current version of the building is no different than traditional construction. Last year, they had an event for Tesla owners, and they marketed the unit as the Tesla of construction. Fortunately, they have since scaled back their claims. During their live webinars, demos, installations, and interviews, they now explain that there is one 3D printed element embedded in the wall. They don't hide their LSM shell in the factory. They're not ashamed that it cracked. They seem to use it as inspiration, and I find that transparency refreshing. Next, the unit is said to be well insulated with an R value of 24. If you watch my R value video, you know that double pane windows have an R value of 2. So even if the solid walls are R24, they are nullified by the expansive R2 glazing. I questioned Sam Rubin about this. So even if that is an R24, the entire, the unit isn't. No, but so we've, as you can see, 
this much glazing, yeah. we are not going the prescriptive route. Yeah. If we went the prescriptive route, it would, I mean, it would look like every box. other bo box with no windows. Because yeah. the Title 24 does not treat small structures well. Yeah. I and mean, there's work underway to try and update it to create a small building energy code that is does actually address the needs of smaller units. But in the meantime, what we've done is we've identified every opportunity to capture po uh, points towards the efficiency. Okay. So the efficiency of our Printed material is a part of that, but yeah. also the fixtures we're choosing, the uh, appliances HVAC we're choosing, system. HVAC All system, uh, we're using a, a hybrid water source heat pump. The next claim is that it prints a home in 24 hours. The experimental 3D printed shell did take 24 hours, but that is not the product being shipped out. Also, like I mentioned in the other video, 3D printers print walls or a shell, not entire homes. Printing the curve at the back of the unit is quicker than manually framing it out, but assembling all the other components from the steel frame to the finished unit definitely takes over 24 hours. Related to this claim is that it uses 95% less labor hours and 95% less waste than traditionally built homes. Now, that's not with the current version, but if they manage to print the entire shell without wood or steel studs, then it could be true. All right, now let's move on to all the good things about this company. They make very strategic incremental improvements. Instead of single or multifamily dwelling, they started off with ADUs or accessory dwelling units. Why did you pick that industry out of everything? Yeah, so in California, starting in 20, with laws passed in 2016 that went into effect January 2017, and have, there's been a, ser a series of laws since then, they've really streamlined at the state level the approval process for ADUs and really made ADUs something that you can build anywhere in the state. So uh, that was a perfect niche. So it's a great fill. niche market, yeah. particularly because the small size of ADUs means they're difficult for build, bigger builders and developers to actually build because the overhead for something that small just doesn't pencil out generally. Yeah. And so it was a great opportunity for us to enter the market, enter a niche market that's growing. I think it was over $2 billion last year already in California alone. Wow. Isn't going back to that too expensive for builders and developers. Those who are who we've always seen as our long-term customers. Yeah. And we'll still be going direct to consumer and we love working with homeowners and the, the smile on their face when we hand them the keys, there's nothing like it. Yeah. But to really have impact. Yeah. We can't be just delivering a unit here, or a unit there. It's about yeah. how do we do 10, 20, 50, Small 500 scale. at a time. Yeah. And that involves working with the, your bigger builders and developers. Yeah. And so the ADU market was an awesome opportunity to deliver some high quality products mm -hmm. that meet a need here in California, take advantage of those uh, streamline permitting, but also demonstrate to our future B2B customers our ability to deliver. They also work very closely with Underwriters Laboratory, or UL, state and local officials, to create regulatory standards for 3D printing. Their designs are approved throughout the state of California, which speeds up the permitting process. All you need is a local permit for the foundation and utilities and a plan check for zoning purposes. We're doing a lot of work on the regulatory side yeah. because it's so important. I mean, Building codes, as, and you guys are architects, you understand the building codes are written in blood. Like they exist because yeah. things went wrong and people have died and gotten severely injured. Yeah. And it's so important if we're bringing a new technology, especially one as novel and unique as this, that we're doing everything possible to demonstrate that safety. And so that's part of our incremental approach. Yeah. But it's also part of why we want to create standards because if something, if someone else in the space builds a house and it collapses, that's not just going to impact them. That's going to impact all of us who are trying to bring this technology uh, to the forefront. According to Sam Rubin, None of the four founders come from a construction background, so they approach this venture with humility. We believe in disruption, but yes. we believe in disruption through collaboration. Yeah. We're not trying to come in and replace the legacy builders. We're not trying to come in like an Uber or someone and say, and just flaunt the laws and regulations. Yeah. We're coming in and we're trying to say, hey, this is what we're seeing. This is what we're thinking. This is what the technology we're bringing to the table. This is all the work we're already doing on the regulatory side. What are we missing? What do we, what do you see that we don't like, mm -hmm. cause we under, like, Part of why we're doing what we're doing is because we didn't know we weren't supposed to. Because none of us, like none of the founding team comes from construction. Yes. Which is a blessing because it allows us to bring a beginner's mind. Yeah. But it only works if we're humble. And that's something that's been really important to us is being, being humble, recognizing there's a lot we don't know. There's a lot of expertise in the industry that's really useful. Another reason I'm intrigued with this company is because they use synthetic stone or LSM instead of concrete. I think using synthetic stone gives them a leg up on their competition that uses concrete and will help them get to their goal of carbon neutrality by 2028. They intend to create LSM panels that act as air, water, vapor, fire, and thermal barriers. Sam Rubin called them structurally insulated panels on steroids. 
Not enough people have heard of LSM. So when they look Correct. at this, they think 3D printing. They, they don't realize that us 3D printing is a technology and you can use so many raw materials to achieve the end product. Yep. So is there a lot of mix up between what y'all are using and concrete? And do you have to educate the market on that? We do, yeah. So we definitely have a lot of people who when they first reach out to us, they're like, oh, I've heard of 3 you're using concrete, right? I'm like, actually, no. Yeah. And I get to, and it's a great opportunity to explain how we use a light, a material that cures using light, um, the advantages of that in terms of being able to print different forms and shapes, but also to achieve better energy efficiency, lighter weight, um, don't have the requirement to only print a couple feet, stop, let it cure, add exactly. rebar, let it cure, pour it's concrete It's like instantaneous into that. curing, right? Exactly. Okay. Um, so there, there's a lot of education, and I mean, people end up more excited when they learn about it, just because of the benefits that we have with uh, three with our material versus concrete. Yeah. So what about the life cycle, lifespan of mm -hmm. LSM? What happens at the end of this? Can it be crushed down to use yeah. like for countertops or something else? Yeah. So we've done accelerated aging, aging tests out past 70 years with only about 10% degradation, which wow. is really good compared to traditional materials. Yeah. Because obviously, if you didn't touch a wood house for 70 years, it's going to be in a lot. It's going be in rough shape. Yeah. Uh, but one of the exciting things is we've been thinking about end of life from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So currently we can grind it up. We use it as filler and new material okay. up to about 10%. In the current one, we use like borax and stuff. In the new one version with the fiberglass, we actually use gla recycled glass beads. Yeah. Well, that's one of the cool things about what we're doing is that it has that versatility to play well with others. So it's not like every single material that goes with it has to be proprietary and has to be new material. You right. can Because there's so many people out there who know the knowledge and the yeah. experience is really vital. Yep. And they know how to use traditional materials. So if you slowly implement one thing with the traditional material, they'll embrace it and then slowly learn how to use your material exactly. too. So that, yeah, yeah. It's, it's meeting people where they're at. So it's like you said in the beginning, you're not displacing all those people in the industry. You're yeah. kind of educating them and implementing this like a new form it, of construction. Exactly. So, yeah. We're trying to. We're, what we're doing is we're creating another tool. Yeah. For them to use and one that we hope will help unlock the productivity needed to meet all the housing goals. And at the end of the day, we're not actually trying to replace jobs. We're actually just trying to address the fact we don't have enough people to build. Yeah. So we need better ways to build that really maximize the value of that human touch, but also technologies that are going to attract a new generation of workers into the industry. Yes. Uh, people who are going, becoming, joining the gig economy or becoming programmers, but in past generations would have been here, hands-on, building, building the future with us. Like We want them to see themselves in construction again. And so we're really excited about that possibility as well. Yeah. The company also prides themselves in providing turnkey solutions. They take care of the permitting process, entitlements, foundation, utilities, drainage, on-site labor, crane, truck delivery, etc. They're using the lessons learned from the modular units towards larger, mighty houses in Rancho Mirage, California, also called Coachella Valley. Flexible solar panels on the roof will apparently not only power the home, but an outdoor pool too. A one-bedroom, one-bath house will cost around $220,000, while a three-bedroom, two-bath house will cost around $430,000. They plan to completely eliminate heavy gauge steel in this design. They will rely on light gauge steel for interior partitions and fiber reinforced panels with proprietary connections for the exterior walls. Another great thing about this company is that they aren't marketing these 3D printed units as homeless shelters. They acknowledge the fact that these units aren't cheap. Their smallest unit costs $600 per square foot. They are trying to reach the missing middle firefighters, teachers, and people who serve the community. And so that's who we're really targeting initially for a couple reasons. One, we didn't want to get pigeonholed as just being uh, homeless housing. Yeah. Because if we, I mean, that, that was a real fear from a brand perspective. If we start there, everyone's only going to ever think of us as that. When again, our vision is to be, be truly market agnostic and be able yeah. to serve luxury or supportive yeah. and everything in between. So by starting with the missing middle, we found an area that we can really target, that there's a real need that a lot of people aren't focusing on yet. And also, admittedly, we're more expensive. We're not our price point isn't where because we're not at scale yet. Our supply chain is yes. once our supply chain scales, then we're can be able to bring our cost down to where we can really do supportive housing. But the other interesting thing is affordable housing is actually more expensive to build than market rate. So, so I mean, I think it's in the San Francisco. I think it's a million dollars a unit. Bay Area, it's like seven hundred fifty thousand. Across California, is like five hundred thousand dollars for a single unit of affordable what? housing. So once we move into multi-story, with which we're accelerating our development of that ability, mm -hmm. I think that's really going to allow us to go into capital A affordable housing. However, when Oakland Mayor Libby Schaff visited their factory last year, she pushed a very different narrative. So this is a quantum leap towards really making the supply and affordability of housing change overnight. We love innovation and we love innovation for social good. 
This is like tech and innovation meets housing crisis. It really bugs me that politicians cling on to these trending buzzwords like 3D printed housing to appease their base and give them false hope, spreading misinformation about fixing the supply and affordability of housing overnight hurts this business because it is so much more than that. To box them into social housing is unfair to both the public and the company. It doesn't seem to affect their ability to secure funding though. It was a very interesting factory tour because I started off very disappointed when I realized that the entire shell wasn't 3D printed. But when I learned about their roadmap, decision making, incremental changes and collaboration with city officials, I appreciated them more. I find those unsexy, realistic truths attractive, not the sensationalist, misleading claims in the media. A big thanks to Mighty Buildings for arranging the tour and providing me with all the B-roll footage. I'll link their website in the description below. I'll also link my Patreon page if you can support me, I'd really appreciate it. A big thank you to everyone already supporting me. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching. See ya.